we're at war. It's probably the most uh, important war of our of our civilization. Welcome to Nature Magic. Today I'm talking to Randall Plunkett, 21st Baron of Dunsany Castle in County Meath. The Plunkett family motto is make haste slowly. And through Randall's dedication to rewilding the estate, he is at the forefront of the battle to fight the biodiversity crisis. The ancient slow growing trees are the backbone to the project that leaves 750 acres to nature. A charismatic figure, Randall is a film director and movie maker, and as he said himself, a bit of a goth. His latest movie, The Green Sea, is available to rent on Sky and YouTube now. It is appropriate to his character that his favorite tree is the yew, typically found in graveyards. His love for heavy metal music and an innate anger at injustice creates a force to be reckoned with. He's holding up the flag amongst an army of eco-warriors to fight against the destruction of nature and our planet. So welcome to Nature Magic and hi Randall. Thank you very much for being on the podcast. So I think to start, you're, you're very welcome. I think to start, I'd love to ask you a little bit about where you are because it's a very special place and project that I've recently heard of. So I'm in a, a delightful place in County Meath called Dunsany. And it's an ancient, ancient estate from the Norman era. Uh, I'm in the castle here at the moment and it's about 900 years old. And it was the borderline of the pale. So there's a lot of forestry uh, we have about 500 acres of mature forest. Uh, it's interesting, though, because our lands have seen many wars, seen many changes, yet it still holds a little bit of wild from the old country. You know, we have these 300-year-old oaks, 300-year-old ash trees. And the thing is, what's interesting about Dunsany is so many different kinds of trees are in our forest. We have obviously huge beech forests and et cetera, but there's also more modern species growing there as well that have come with the birds. So we have, of course, big sycamores. We have big, uh, we have big, we even have spruce, but it's all working in harmony together. And I suppose it looks a lot like Irish society today, not exactly what it used to be, but something progressive and way better than it used to be because we have so much variety. That's a great analogy as well, and, and I totally agree. And I think perhaps the first question is always, do you remember when you became an advocate for nature? Uh, perhaps it has something to do with the land. Well, I'll tell you something now, to be perfectly honest, with you, my family have always been advocates for nature. They've always planted trees. I mean, although my great grandfather were big into shooting things, they also campaigned quite a bit for animal rights, particularly towards dogs, not getting their tails cut off and things like that. Now, my father planted a huge amount of trees here, which I get to enjoy every day I would go outside. And they were lots of oaks and beautiful Scots pines and things like that. So I suppose I had a little bit of a, a, an environmental friendly home. But I think the time that changed for me was when I first went on my journey of removing uh, farm animals from the land and allowing the land to do what it wants and that was where i sort of discovered my first day of my journey because the truth of the matter was i had no idea what wild was because the wild of ireland doesn't really exist it's a something you read about in novels you know it, there's there's no wild left and the the sort of little rugged areas that you find maybe even places like wicklow are you know, there's sort of spruce plantations now, and I suppose it's a different, it's it's wild 2.0, but it's still not what I read. And I suppose I was very saddened by the fact that I'd been to places like Germany, and there I saw really isolated locations with massive amounts of forestry and places where you could really get lost. And I, I'm a bit of a romantic anyway with, you know, being in the film industry, I, I, I create stories and I always... I, I was always fascinated by the idea of being lost in nature. You know, those, those kinds of, those Jack London style stories just really resonated with me since I was a boy. Um, so I guess I, I kind of embarked on that journey. And part of it was because I was examining a, I was writing a script at the time that dealt with animals, well, sorry, animals, with, with humanity disappearing from the land. 
And if you know anything about me and what I do for a living, I'm a filmmaker, but I would consider myself a method writer. Now for your audience who doesn't know what method work is, it's typically used in acting where an actor will become the role. Rather than pretending to be the character, they will live as the character. They will talk like the character, they will do all the habits and that develops a understanding for the character that can be uh, very, very um, advantageous when performing. I don't do that, I'm not an actor, um, so I don't do that exactly. I do it as a writer. So I will often be or, or examine the things that I'm, the issues that I'm dealing with. Uh, from that sort of way of working, I have found many hobbies and discovered many things. Um, and I would say the most uh, prominent thing I discovered was the wild because I allowed the land to, to have no humans on it, no minimalist uh, activity and and what happened was was the beginnings of my rewilding project and here I am seven nearly eight years later and well the, the project never came to fruition but the uh, the remnants of of the idea grew into this thing that I would say is, is blossomed into a wonderful flowering plant that's so inspiring and yes I never thought of method writing very interesting for the listeners I can feel that you have a great, great love for the trees. One of the questions is a favorite plant or animal that you might like to speak about. Is there something particular that you feel connected to? There's a few. Um, the yew tree is one of my favorite trees. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> the reason I like it so much is, one, they're commonly associated with, uh, with, with churches and, and, and particularly graveyards, and me being a somewhat of a goth i always appreciate anything a bit gothic but i love the fact that they're a beautiful tree they grow in in the darkness because they're they're sh they grow well in shade they are a sort of they never lose their leaves so i would say they never lose their charm they're highly poisonous and they're poisonous to taste they're poisonous sticks and and they will kill you but they also have the sweetest berry that is not poisonous however if you eat a pip you'll be dead. And I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, apparently the berries are the sweetest berries that you can get in Ireland, naturally. Um, and I've had them and I'm not dead. Um, <laughs> um, and the thing is, however, if you swallow a pip, you're, you're a goner. Um, I, I believe the term was if you eat two pips, you'll be, you'll be, in, a, you'll be in a box. Okay. But what I love about that tree so much is, is if you look at it, it's, it's so abrasive on so many levels it's it, it lives a very long time so it, it lives to see all the bigger trees disappear mm -hmm. and it's so much so that once it gets to a certain age it becomes hollow to allow itself to be to be more aerodynamic so it is basically Ireland's olive tree and although it's poisonous it also bears the sweetest fruit and I find the irony of that to be to be wonderful Oh, it's a very special irony. And uh, they planted the yew trees in graveyards to stop local people putting their stock in. Um, That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, the, yeah, oh, but there's so many things I'd like to ask you, but one little story I want to tell you about getting lost in nature. So we only have 25 acres of rewilding or wilderness here. And mm -hmm. a few years ago, the Department of Agriculture guy came around, you know, the guys, they turn up and they want to inspect this, that and the other. And they were looking at forage area. So it was 10 o'clock in the morning. And he said, I'm going to go down into this wild area and check out your forage area. And I said, fine. He had a sat nav. He had everything. Now, we do live in a place called Clunacy, which means Meadow of the Fairies. So anyway, at four o'clock, he knocked on the door and he said, yeah, can you sign the thing now? I'm going home. And I said, well, great. Did you go down to Kimbar and have lunch? Did you enjoy your day? And he said, no, I was lost in your um, bushes. <laughs> for, he had a sat nav it was only 25 acres and he was lost from 10 until 4 <laughs> that's quite good um, but just before we move on why a goth why the the de is it death metal music what is the appeal um, there well let's just say uh, when I was 8 years old I got my first tape and my first tape was Iron Maiden and from then on, you know, I was told when I was 
15, 16. Oh, you'll grow out of that, that rubbish. <laughs> you know, it's a teenager thing. Uh, well, I'm getting close to 40 now. I'm 38 years old. Uh, the, the music has only gotten more abrasive and older. I was a very, very angry uh, teenager, a very, very angry child. I became a very, very angry adult. And I'm a very angry middle-aged man now. <laughs> You don't seem to be angry at all. Um, oh, it, it doesn't matter. You get match. me riled up. <laughs> you get me riled up. I, I assure you, I'm very angry. <laughs> no, I'd, I'd say you're contentious. If there are, yeah, if there's somebody. Yeah. <laughs> but okay, but, but that's interesting. Is, I always resonated with with that, which is ironic because it is very aggressive music. It it has a, a you know, it's not what you'd expect from you know, and even even people like my peer group. Like, that's a very unusual music. I mean, I went to school with lots of people and, you know, everybody at some point or another had a Metallica tape or a CD or something. But, you know, when you start to go to genres like gore grind, <laughs> um, that's a, that's very unusual. That's a very and that's like I said, normally people in their 20s. You don't expect it from people my age necessarily. Yeah. But, so where, where do you think the anger came from or was it in H? Um, what's that about? Uh, I have no idea. I think that's always the way I was. But the thing is, I I I, um, I use that stuff because you know it's it's a very powerful. I was always very. Uh, I found it very difficult in school. I never did well at school. I found learning things to be harder. I always had to work harder than everybody else. I had to work harder on my calligraphy. I had to take grinds every summer, and the frustration and anger of not ever getting things easy definitely was something but what i found was it was a very valuable um asset in my in my work ethic because i would get angry about things uh, rather than sit there and mope i would get angry and angry would make me motivate and that was one of the things that came as a very useful weapon when it came to dealing with things that were let's say difficult mm -hmm. so when i took over the estate uh, there was a lot of difficulties with poachers and things like that and so you know, I use my hatred as a as fuel to combat my, my adversity. Mm -hmm. And I would say to myself, right, poachers are coming at six. I'll be there at five. And, you know, people push me. I push back twice as hard, you know, and it was always that kind of like uh, that aggressive uh, thing that made me push forward. It pushed me forward. People wouldn't give me any opportunities in the film industry. So I said, fine, I'll take my own opportunities. So I would write emails every day. In fact, my first break was on a, a film I did called Out There and nobody backed it. In fact, I had lots of people go against me because of my uh, my background. They they kind of typically were very patronizing towards me because they were like, oh, a lord in a castle wants to try and be creative. That was one thing that somebody said to me mm. and that burned me very badly. So instead I said, you know what, I will see to be in a different position with you one day. So I went to every journalist, every website I could find on the internet, and I did it as a mantra. I'd get up at seven o'clock and I would spend an hour while I drank coffee, waste no time, I'd say, write emails to every single publication. I would, I would chase people in car parks. I would say, right, here's my movie, watch it. Give me a note, say good things or bad things, but you'll be talking about me. Um, and I said to myself, I'm, I, every, I got a, a, a letter from the film board when I got rejected. And the letter wasn't about a, a typical rejection letter. It was very pointed. And it wasn't pointed at the project. It was very geared around bashing me. So I framed that letter because the woman who, who rejected me from the film board, it, it, was, it seemed very personal. And my producer, who's a veteran at, at doing things with the film bodies, figured also that it was very catty. So I framed that picture of that letter. And it's in my office here somewhere. And I regularly look at it for good inspiration because uh, to be perfectly honest, I thank her very much because she was a great motivator for me to go off and do it. And then even when things didn't go well for it, I kept pushing, pushing, pushing. Then people died during the film, I kept pushing. And then, then Mooney ran out, I kept pushing. Then, you know, the editor left and I was left with a movie that wasn't finished, I kept pushing. Then I didn't have enough of the film th shot, I had to reinvent it, I kept pushing. And that's what I do with the environment too. It's not going to, it's not acceptable what we do today. Mm, I'm not right, well, we, we really need that force um, in Ireland and in, well, in 
Europe and in the world. Um, we need that force, if you can harness it towards the governments, towards people in power. I have become inspired by what you have said, because I think I find it even more difficult as a woman, because if you do show anger or force or contentiousness or something, you come across as, as you said, catty. Uh, or so, do you know what I mean? No, not catty, I, bitchy. No, 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 I know exactly what you're saying, because it's it's... These are mechanisms of putting people down. You know what they call you, Caddy, but they call me spoiled rich boy. Oh, yeah. Enti entit entitled, uh, what is it they say? Fellow of entitlement, or what was the other one they, they call me typically? Uh, anyway, um, the point is, is to belittle us uh, by putting us into a category. Right. I get the fact that I work for a living. I work very hard for a living. I work five, five careers. And you know what? I don't complain. I don't ask for any handouts. In fact, the truth of the matter is the only reason I try and get the idea of handouts for, 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 for people like yourself who are doing rewilding is because I will do my rewilding, money, no money, poverty, or, po or no poverty. I'm going to do it one way or the other. Even if I have to sit here with the lights off because I can't afford the electric bill, I'll do it. Because, like I said, that little anger is the best thing that ever happened to me because it's, it's what got me. It makes me, it gets me up in the morning. I wake up and I, and I, and I, I, you know, the movie uh, Patton, as in the general Patton, he's got a great speech at the beginning of that movie where he, he talks about how he's going to beat the Germans and how they're going to do it. And we've got to do them. And the Americans are the toughest people. And I, I like, not that I particularly like war, war movies, but that speech always, I play stuff like that in my head. And my mother used to say to me, because she was also very, uh, had a lot of problems at school. And she used to get her father, her father used to get her to go up the stairs and say, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner, I'm a winner. It's repetition. It's that drive that makes you. And I do the same thing in my own way. And I say, I will not be beaten. I will not be beaten. I will not be beaten. I will rise like a flame. And if and that motivates me because I say to myself, right, rewilding is going to happen. I'm going to convince everyone to do it. It will be the norm. I will make it the norm. And I won't accept anything less. Mm -hmm. And I decided a couple of years ago, that was my, my goal. I'm going to do it. I will continue my career making movies, of course. That, but it all adds together because the culture and the environment very much are in tangent. Um, my movie has a lot of, of influence from rewilding. It's, it has What's a lot the, of is this Is this the new movie, The Green Sea? Yes, it has yes. a lot, of, a lot of uh, nods and inspiration from rewilding. And the, the idea is create, use nature as, as an inspiration, because the environment is one of the most important things in our culture. We, we, we love to talk about Ireland with pride. We talk about our history. We talk about our language. We talk about our music. But we seem to always trip when it comes to our native nature, which is the most important part of our uh, Irish heritage. And it's not the language, it's not the history, it's the environment. Because without it, we have nothing. This yeah. country fed us with our environments. This country, it gave us inspiration. You know, Bram Stoker would not have written Dracula if he didn't wake up in the morning and see the mist over the fields. Mm -hmm. No, I totally agree. And this little place here, 50 acres down in Galway, um, well, until my dying day, it's going to be protected. And it doesn't really matter if money comes in or not. Um, so we've we've had all the things like, um, why do you need a sanct why do you need a sanctuary for bushes then? And you know, there's been a misunderstanding, but people are starting to get a greater understanding of the concept. And oh, it's so slow though, but why it's important, um, biodiversity. So I know you are spiritually connected to nature, but have you had any particular profound experience that you can share with us? Yeah, I mean, there have been many times where I've 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 been crossing these these, like, and and you got to understand that Dunsany is really wild because there is large portions of the land that even I haven't been to, and there's some areas of the forest that is so heavy to cross, you're literally climbing over fallen trees and stuff like that, and the briars are up to you, up to your to your face, and you know you're trying to get through it, and there's it, there's a sort of exploration. I remember crossing part of our swampy forest. And I was looking at elm trees. Now, how rare do you see big, large elm trees? 
in in Ireland in 2020, you know, and I was standing over some elm trees and there was a giant oak in front of me and I was sitting there and I was just sitting there and I just sat and I looked up at these monsters and uh, and suddenly I, I, I looked and there was a, a beautiful red stag, you know, literally in, in a clearing with sunlight beaming on him. You could not, if I had my camera, it would have made an amazing photograph because it was these big, tall behemoth trees in this clearing, in this almost swampy rainforest type forest that I have called the Duck Pond. And it is literally what the, they, they describe in, in as, as temperate rainforest. Um, you know, and there's no, the only paths you see are, are actually what the deer have made. Uh, you certainly don't see people there. And, and not unless, not, not unless I'm not doing my job properly. <laughs> But the uh, but the thing is, is that I looked at this deer and we had a moment and that was very, very groundbreaking. We, it looked at me. I looked at it. It didn't seem too bothered by me. I wasn't too bothered by it. And it continued on and moved off. And it was wonderful. Mm. Huge stack, massive horns. So that's something you can go back to because I can see you, you visualize it when you start talking about it. You'd have to see it for me to describe it properly. But but the thing is, it's it's. There's nothing more beautiful than looking in a place that has huge trees and no signs of life other than, than what's supposed to be there. And it's a rarity. And, and maybe it's not a privilege that everybody gets, but I have enjoyed it very much. And this is the thing that I feel that's very important. There's, there's rewilding is an interesting concept because it, it has, it's such an open concept, so many interpretations. You know, there's so many models of it. I mean, there's th things like what you're doing, which are wonderful and adding so much to the area, to the bees, to everything. There's people who are creating sort of saf safari parks and allowing people to interact with nature. And that's so important because I, part of the, you can't be too selfish with nature either because it is something that really belongs to everybody. But at the same time, you have to protect it. It's, it's, a, it's a gift. and there needs to be some places that that we just don't go you know we need to we need to allow you know some uh some oasis to mm. exist and that's i never i never thought of it yeah i never thought of it in that particular way um what can you suggest for people or encourage people to do to help biodiversity well i would personally say waste nothing because that's the first thing I mean, I, I, I consider, again, going back to my slightly aggressive uh, personality, we're at war. It's probably the most uh, important war of our, of our civilization, because if we're not careful, we will end up like the dinosaurs. Now, I can't claim that the dinosaurs were ruined because of global warming per se, but the thing is, is that we are at a time, our entire civilization is based on 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 a house of cards, the way we produce food, the way we live, the way we consume is literally unsustainable. And we have to counteract uh, the damage we've done. And I, I have, the, you see, the, the ethos is wrong. What I do here is when I take something from nature, for example, I harvest a piece of wood from the forest. I always leave some behind. I allow 50% of all of the trees that fall down to stay down forever. The other half I get to take. And we have a, have a, we don't allow nature to have its own piece of the pie. We take everything. And the problem is when you take everything, you leave nothing. And if you leave nothing, eventually something will happen. Now, whether that starts with invasive species, whether that starts with disease, whether that starts with things dying, and I think we've been taking everything for far too long. So what I would say to people is waste nothing. You have those big barrels, those paint brushes, the paint, paint um, containers, drill a hole in the bottom, go collect some seeds, stick them in the ground. You don't, you don't have a garden, use your windowsill, put wildflowers. You have a garden, great, rewild some of it. Try, you know, mixed flowers, try, try things, get bird boxes. You see, the thing is, is that it's not, it's not a nuclear bomb that's going to save the world. It's it's going to be micro micro attacks. We got to attack it from every side. We got to have rewilding. We've got to have solar panels. We've got to have, you know, 
less waste. We've got to recycle more. We've got to have make better food choices. We've got to get away from this false uh, truth that we must use chemicals. And before anyone of your audience hits me on the chemicals thing, chemicals are like medicine. You take medicine when you're sick. You don't take medicine every day just to live. And if you do, you've got bigger problems. And that's the idea I have. I've never been, I, don't get me wrong, I'm not pro-chemicals. But if you, if you are sick, if something is wrong, you use chemicals. That's fine. I, I, I do see both sides. But you can't live on those things. And if you continue to pollute chemicals, just like if you continue to take medication, if you take pills every day, it will catch up with you. And we're making the land sick. And we're destroying the soil. And that is soil is our is our life's blood. More than what it gives us as food, it protects our, our environment. You know, we keep letting our carbon out of the soil because we are plowing the living life out of the land and not allowing land to recover, not allowing any green spaces, allowing no hedgerows. We are literally destroying our future one hedgerow at a time. Mm. And the thing is, is that all of these things we're extremely savvy. I have a, a huge belief that the human race will evolve into something even better than it is already. I'm not entirely sure whether we'll be cyborgs or not, but that's you know remains to be seen. But the truth of the matter is, I'm a big believer of evolution. But I also feel that somewhere along the line, the human race has sort of lost touch with its environment, which is dangerous. We've lost we've lost track. Because the thing is, is that we as a human race, we're one, perhaps one of the only species that doesn't fit well with its environment. And I believe that that has become this because we've over obsessed over a certain kind of brain activity. And if you look at it, how, how biodiversity works, when you rewild the field, the first thing you get is an initial growth of one or two species. Then gradually over time, those species decline and you get different things appearing and young, young birds drop new seeds in there. And then seven, 10 years later, you have lots of patches of things. You know, but the problem we have as a civilization is we like one kind of thing. We like roses, but we don't like thistles, right? If you think about that, you're creating already a, a tier system over this is better than this. And that brain pattern leads to racism, leads to, to uh, social snobbery. You see, it's like the brain is a muscle. The more we train it in a certain way, the more we make those mental connections, and that kind of has a knock-on effect to every aspect of our lives. I mean, if you look at sexism or racism or any of those things, they come from a pattern. No, no child, no baby is racist. Those things are programmed. And it's not in our nature to, to detest each other. That, that is something that we've learned. Yes, there's always been uh, you know, predators and there's always been certain kinds of, 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 of uh, territory. That, that's very common in nature. But the, th the truth of the matter is these activities can be unlearned. It's, it's become part of our programming. And we don't have to accept that. We, we have succeeded with science and technology that we, can, we have can succeed with our own minds. If we want to change, we can. I never thought 10 years ago I would be a vegan person standing there on a soapbox uh, trying to shout for the environment. I never thought that was going to happen. I, 10 years ago, I ate steak every morning and I lifted weights and I was only interested in myself. And now I changed my programming. And I'm not saying that I'm perfect, I'm no saint or anything like that, but if I was able to do it, the last of the class, angry kid, then why can't the intelligent people who top, top the class, why can't the people who, who are compassionate do it? Because the truth of the matter is, there is no excuses, just like the environmental crisis. There is no excuses. We make excuses because we don't want to change. People say to me, ah, oh, but, but, you know, we need these. They, they, they hold on. It's the idea that you, you want to lose weight. You don't want to, you don't want to run on a treadmill and you want your, your, your low calorie chocolate. But the truth is you're still eating chocolate. If you want to lose weight, you do exercise and you make healthier choices. But if you keep trying to, it's the same with, with the concept of, of trying to, to make slightly better agriculture. The truth of the matter is organic is only a first step into a much more sophisticated farming model. But I also believe that we grow gradually. You know, my family's motto is make haste slowly. And that's exactly where we are at today. 
We need to make massive changes, but we need to go slow. We need to adjust our civilization. We need to change our, the way we eat food, the way we look at food, the way we waste food, food waste. You know, waste is the biggest sin of the 21st century. You know, it isn't murder, it's waste. We waste like nobody's business. We destroy land every year to make more food so we can waste even more. You know, if you had to tell me we have to cut down the rainforest to feed the population, I would say, you know, those, that's a necessary evil. But that's bullshit. We don't need to make that waste because what we are doing is we are trying to create a situation. We waste 50% of supermarket food. I mean, that's, 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 that's obscene when you have people in Africa starving. You know, we want to have cheap, cheap choices. But cheap, there's nothing, there's such thing as anything cheap eventually you pay down the line and that's the truth and that's those are the kinds of things where we need to really have a look at ourselves as people and say is that good enough are we are the choices i'm making today are they are they good enough for the for the repercussions that my great grandchildren are going to have because i assure you they are not you know when when people say to me ah oh, you know uh things are changing i think things aren't changing enough we have to look at our look at your grandchildren i mean i presume you have children Look at your children in the face and say to them, you're not going to get to see otters. You're not going to get to have clean water that doesn't come out of a plastic bottle. And you're never going to see wildlife unless it's in a, in a book or in a zoo. Is that good enough for you? Because it's not good enough for me. Very well our, said. Our, our people deserve more than what we're going to give them. And we had all the advantages as people. We had the technology. We had, we had the privilege. Let's be honest. We're in the Western world here. We have so much privilege, and yet, what did we do with our privilege? We squandered it. Did we, did we grow into something more superior than we were? No, we were just a bunch of animals who wanted cheap steak. And that's it. That's what we contributed. We destroyed everything, had a bit of fun, and nobody. And we left the next generation to clean up the mess. Absolutely mm -hmm. unforgivable. Yeah. So, so I decided I'm going to make something of myself and go rewilding, and that's why I assure everybody I am here trying to get everybody to do rewilding because it, it the game ain't finished yet and we can make a difference today mm -hmm. yeah the game ain't finished i agree with that those topics were very well put and i totally agree change is the hardest thing for everybody so would you say that we are at war with greed we are at war with numerous things but greed is definitely we have to it's greed is a perfectly healthy emotion in 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 its control sense it's like it's part of the human the human condition is to have a certain amount of greed but the problem is when your greed uh becomes out of control you have a problem a certain amount of ambition a certain amount of want a certain amount of consumption is acceptable but we have gone beyond acceptable we have gone to the point of wasteful of of, of toxic and that's the point Everything works as a balance, include, including our negative emotions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any books or a book that you'd like to recommend to the listeners? Something inspiring Ooh. that they can follow up this conversation with, perhaps? I don't like to endorse any one thing. I, I think that there's quite a few good rewilding books. I think the popular one is Isabella's Tree's book. I think that's very accessible. Mm -hmm. We don't exactly see eye to eye. Isabella Tree and myself, but I think it's if you're considering rewilding, um, that is certainly one of them. Uh, Porrick Fogarty's uh, Whittled Away is is one that I would absolutely say is is great. Uh, he's a friend of mine. I love his attitude, and he is fighting every day um, for a, a better world. And he's not in it for the money, which I really appreciate. He's truly a passionate man. I really like him. Um, and uh, so I would say, though, that's certainly a good one. I would say Riddle the Way is, is a must. Yeah, um, yeah we've had Porik on the podcast. The, he's brilliant. He's, he's good and he's, yeah. uh, he's genuine. He's, he's not, and he's not selling you anything. Yeah. That's the other thing. Because be always careful with anyone who's got good intentions and is trying to sell you something. Mm -hmm. Because the truth of the matter is, is like, uh, there's many rewilding. Pro rewilding is a great thing. But rewilding is also can be a mechanism for a, as a business plan. And if you're trying to, there's nothing wrong with making money. Money is a good thing. It makes the world go around and all that stuff. But the truth of the matter is, as long as the there's honesty within it, if the if the if the reasons behind things are 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 true, and you're not just selling a brand because 
people have argued of greenwashing, and I can't object to that term because it does exist, greenwashing. And not everything is as, um, as clear as it seems. So the truth is, I, I, uh, I, I, it's a very interesting topic, rewilding, because there's so many people coming. It's it's a conversation. I have a I'm the probably the first vegan rewilding, uh, large scale rewilding project. Uh, all animals in Dunsania are created equal. It's probably the only place in Ireland where that's true. So if you're a rat or you're a bird, you have you have a right for life here. Now that is not the case in other rewilding cave places, but that's part of the, the joys of a conversation. I have my little flag, they have theirs. We all meet in the middle and we're all part of the scientific exploration of our environment. Mm, so hopefully we can all meet in that lovely glen you described with the stag and the, the light shining in and the tall trees and gather the army and try and march in the right direction. Um, it's very, very inspiring. It's um, start with what's on your plate. Motivating talk. Start with what's in front of you. So, if you had a magic wand, what would you do for the planet today? I would get Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos together, and I would demand that they go and, and buy a huge tracts of land in places like Asia and Brazil, and start planting trees. Because anyone whose company is called Amazon, who wastes as much as they do, and are trying to go to visit the moon for their personal vanity holidays, I find is detestable and should be doing something to give back to the planet, considering that they have been so privileged to get the benefits of the planet for so long. I was born into privilege. I'm trying to pay back my privilege to, to make it me worthy of having such privilege. I haven't seen anything on there. Now they can say that they're doing some yoga, whatever, or they're doing some nice charity things. Bullshit. Where is my Amazon rainforest that the man should be planting? He's actually already called the Amazon. So why isn't he doing something about that? The man has all the money in the world. And he doesn't need to go to space. He needs yeah. to fill the space between his ears and stop stop with focusing on the rubbish. If he was going there for to find new life or do something interesting for science, but he's going there for, for his own ego, for his own fun, I find that absolutely distasteful at a time with 150 German people drowned to this year and there's fires all over Greece and places like that. And he's off in space. I agree. Oh, he's fun. really in the top of that pyramid of a tier system that you spoke about. And he's sucking the lifeblood out of everybody else in the pyramid. <laughs> but the, tr the truth is, is with, with people like that, it's time for people like Prince Charles. It's time for, for people like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, you know, all these famous, powerful people who could make a lot of positive change. It's time we all looked in the mirror and said to ourselves, like, not everybody can make those. We all have to make changes. But the people who have the most, who have the most power, who have the most money, it's time they all did something. Because this is our planet, regardless of how much you own. It's our planet. We all share it. And with the environment, it's... It, we're guests amongst the environment. It's not the other way around. And it's time for us to really start looking into the future. And I would ask those people in it, if I was at a table with them, is like, when you look at your, your grandchildren, when you look at the future, what do you see? Because if you see space, there's something wrong with you. Well, I hope that they get to hear this podcast and they get that, this message um, loud and clear. And look, Randall, it was fantastic to have you on the podcast. Uh, thank thank you, so you so much. much. I hope that it's very stirring words for people. We need somebody with your kind of energy to push movements. And uh, hopefully we can all come together and try and make the changes that you were talking about. Well, I hope I hope nobody's depressed and nobody's going to go and break <laughs> anything in anger. So <laughs> although I'm joking aside, good motivator. Yeah, very good. Um, so would you like to tell us how, if you want anybody to contact you, how you can be contacted, what your movies are, what your projects you're doing? I'll put everything in the show notes, but just give us a little bit of a... Um... So if, if you want to support me, by the way, my rewilding project, there is no money in there. It is a completely pure thing. Money, uh, I made the decision very early on that money could change my perception of what my end goal was. So I wasn't willing to take any handouts. I wasn't willing to, to be steered in any direction. Science is my thing. But what I do, I, I pay for everything myself, but that means I need to sell movies. 
So if you really want to support rewilding or want to support Dunsany, the best thing is you go out there and purchase a movie because that does have a, a trickle effect that all that money that I have, I put back into the, into the wild, into the estate. And that helps me a lot. So that's the first thing. So just, thing just, you, just on that one, Randall. So you've got the green sea at the moment. The and green I, sea is available. And if you want to get it cheap, and there's nothing wrong with getting a bargain. So you can go to yeah. Sky and search for get the green sea. Sky, YouTube is, is available and uh, Google Play and Amazon Prime. Funny enough. Okay, um, and that's great for me if you can if people can support that film. The next thing, I suppose, if you want to connect with us directly, we have a Facebook page called Dunsany Nature Reserve. We have an Instagram page, Dunsany Nature Reserve as well. If you want to connect with me personally and follow some of the other things I do, uh, Randall Plunkett in Instagram and on Facebook. And you can send me emails. You can uh, send me death threats if you like. Um, <laughs> you can do anything you like. Um, I, and I do, I do see things. I, I am, I am a bit of a one man army. So if it, I might be a little slow on on some things, but uh, you know. And we do actually offer a very limited guided tour of Dunsany. Now, the idea behind the guided tour is to get people excited about rewilding, to expose people to what real rewilding is. Um, there's a, they do small donations, but those donations, again, do not go to me. They go into replanting trees and feeding animals because I am working very hard with the animal hospital. And before we go, can you just tell us about the otter releases and your connection partnership with the animal hospital? Because we've had so, them on the show as well. So we're, we're talking, I believe in a no waste policy at Dunsany. No space should be wasted. So we have old buildings, old setups, things like tennis courts and things that we are converting into animal enclosures to help with orphaned animals or injured animals to get them rehabilitated and get them ready to go back into the wild. Um, this is not a zoo and it's not a petting zoo, uh, but we are trying our best to give nature the best opportunity. Sometimes because of the way things have turned out, you need to give nature just a bit of help. And that's what we try and do here. In the, in the best way for animals to succeed is, is to get the care they need and then slowly get used to being in the wild and, and develop slowly. As, as our motto is, you make haste, but you do it slowly. And that's what we do with the animals. So all those donations go into that sort of stuff. They pay for that stuff and, and security, because unfortunately my, uh, my life is a little bit threatened these days with various people who get a little bit rough with me. And so security and uh, we have secret cameras that we put up in the forest to stop poaching and animal crime. And we will be prosecuting those people, I assure you. Okay, okay. So I think we'll leave it at that. I'll put everything in the show notes. Anything else you think of, you can send me on an email. And we'll leave it with your lovely family motto. Let's fight the biodiversity crisis. Let's make haste slowly. Exactly. Thank you for listening to Nature Magic. It's wonderful to find all these inspiring people who are making a difference and speaking up for nature. News this week is that unfortunately Borough Nature Sanctuary has closed again due to another COVID issue. There is great uncertainty around the pandemic for businesses and it has affected everyone in some way, so there is no point complaining. The cafe and shop are now being re-advertised on daft.ie. Please tell anyone who you think might enjoy working at this beautiful site. I will put the link to the ad in the show notes. We continue on with our biodiversity work and look forward to a visit by the Botany and Plant Science Department in NUIG, the National University of Ireland Galway, and the National Botanic Gardens next weekend for the final seed collecting session to supply the National Native Seed Bank. <laughs>